and welcome to our cardiovascular imaging conference. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, it's great to be on a good start of the year and talk about viability. Um, we are very viable and energetic to start this year. And uh, I'd like to share with you that we will do this at a collaborative, multi-modality imaging way. So I will start it with uh, addressing the issues in general about myocardial viability, an amazing topic, uh, quite of, of interest in the topic. Not much late research in it, but I think it's very important from a clinical point of view to keep it in mind as we take care of patients or do imaging. Dr. al Malah will address uh, nuclear and PET, and Dr. Deepan Shah, our head of cardiovascular imaging, will address cardiac MRI. Just a little retrospective for you to put it in context. This is 40 years ago when the late Dr. Rahim Tula proposed uh, the word hibernation, and this is what we're going to talk about mostly today. We're not going to address myocardial stunning, which occurs uh, after a short period of ischemia in an individual, but the, the recovery of function is rather uh, of a shorter duration as opposed to myocardial hibernation where you have chronic ischemia and with after revascularization, ventricular function improves, just like in this case, depicting that in the early days trying to see post-nitroglycerin whether there's myocardial reserve and after bypass surgery with resumption of, of decent resting coronary flow, ventricular function improved significantly. And this was a new concept at that time because before that, uh, people thought that if myocardial function is depressed, if you had a myocardial infarction in the past, that recovery function does not occur. Now for us clinicians and uh, for also our imagers, these are the modalities nowadays that you should be using one way, singularly or in combination, to um, identify whether there is myocardial viability and therefore the prospect of recovery of function after revascularization. Now it's very important to keep that in mind because even the electrocardiogram per se may be of benefit to you as a clinician. There's echocardiography with its modalities, uh, standard nuclear and PET, uh, cardiac CT a little less nowadays because it requires perfusion imaging, and cardiac MRI, which is among all the others that we uh, talk about, is the one that can actually visualize a scar with uh, gadolinium enhancement. The others are either looking at myocardial uh, function or metabolism or perfusion. Just to depict the anatomy of what we're talking about. So, all these sections of this heart could be dysfunctional at rest. If you take a look at an echocardiogram or an MRI, you may see hypokinesis or even akinesis. And the big question is, how do you differentiate, and I put these in dotted uh, points here, how do you differentiate a viable myocardium from partially viable myocardium in this situation, a subendocardial infarction with still some remnants of viability or a true transmural myocardial infarction where you're not going to have any recovery of function. Now, why is this important? It is important because you can identify individuals who benefit from revascularization. So remember, the premise here and the foundation is that you have significant coronary disease to start with. It's not an open artery. It's not a cardiomyopathy. Prediction of recovery, regional and global, after revascularization, and importantly for individuals who have heart failure is that in advanced heart failure to help decide on management. Is this revascularization? Nowadays is lesser of an issue because you could do revascularization off pump. You could do revascularization with protected, uh, you know, with protection devices and so many other things as opposed to when we were dealing with 20, 30 years ago in those situations where it was an all or non phenomenon being on bypass or not. So this is important for the fellows and for the clinicians. These are the indicators of viability. Angina, if an individual has angina, you have viability. Now the question is the angina and the distribution of normal function versus abnormal function, you're gonna have to determine that. 
lack of, lack of Q waves in somebody who has regional or global dysfunction and coronary disease. Hypokinesis by itself tells you that there is some thickening, there is some viability. Contractile reserve, we'll talk about that with, with uh, dobutamine. Radionuclide uptake, uh, greater than 50 or 60 percent by thallium or others, and PET mismatch, Dr. Al-Mala will talk about that. Inducible ischemia by any methodology. If I'm inducing ischemia and this area of function is abnormal, you will see that it has a higher propensity for improvement in function, meaning because most likely it is repetitive ischemia. That's the underlying mechanism. And the last is no or minimal delayed enhancement with gadolinium on, on CMR. So let's talk a little bit about echocardiography quickly here before letting the others talk about their modalities. Lack of Q waves, and this is by Dr. Jong when he was here from Korea, and this is quite a few years ago. If you look at no Q waves in somebody who has depressed ventricular function and coronary disease, no Q waves. So basically a normal electrocardiogram, you could take it to the bank that indeed you're going to have a lot of viability. Specificity is 72%, but sensitivity is low, obviously. Okay? So that's important. As opposed, as, and this is in the same cohort of dobutamine stress echo and SPECT imaging. So keep that in mind because that's important. In echo, we do most of the time a stressor, a dobutamine stress echocardiography. In the early days, we either used low dose to look at contractile reserve, or in our institution, we did actually quite a bit of the studies early days with Dr. Imran Afridi, pushing it to look at other, what happens to the myocardium when you induce ischemia or high-dose stress in those situations. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, this is such an example. You could see this is a depressed myocardium with some improvement in function after, revas after uh, you know, with, with stress. But it's interesting that there is not a single dose that will give you the maximal improvement in contractility. Usually, these are the lower doses. Hmm? So 7.5, 10 mics, and even at times you may start having some decrement in function even at 10 mics because the reserve may not be that high. And if you think about it, it is somewhat uh, paradoxical is that if you have significant coronary disease and low flow, how come that you can have even contractile reserve? Because most likely, and we've done some of the uh, you know, validation early on, is that you have depression, further depression of myocardial function conceivably, teleologically, to protect the myocardium. There is TNF-alpha that is highly secreted uh, locally. There is also a change in, in uh, beta receptors at, at the uh, molecular level. So there are a lot of adaptive mechanisms. That's why you still have some contractile reserve in these individuals. Now, so if you give dobutamine low and high doses, you may end up with four different responses. Either no change. Paradoxically, you may have sustained improvement, almost like a cardiomyopathy. Sustained improvement, no ischemia, even with high doses. Pure worsening. And most importantly, you get a biphasic response, meaning an improvement at rest, uh, at low dose, if you will and then worsening with the higher doses. And I think this is the most predictive, as you could see here from this early publication, this is the most predictive, if you have a biphasic response, of viability and predictive of improvement in function after revascularization. Most of these revascularizations in that study were with PCI. The interesting thing also, I'm not showing it to you here, is not the improvement in function at rest is just look at what happens to this heart when you demand more. When you stress them maximally after revascularization, the change in function is, is dramatic, is really dramatic, and that's what patients most likely will feel during exertion. Now, if you have pure worsening, yes, it has some predictive value. If you have just improvement, very little predictive value. It's almost like a cardiomyopathic response. So if you open up the artery, you're not, you're not going to improve function because it was not ischemic even to start with. Now, there are two ways of doing dobutamine. One, pushing it to the max so you get ischemia, or quite a few in, in our European colleagues, 
we do low dose, just low dose dobutamine, and that's fine. What is the trade-off? With low dose, you'll get higher sensitivity, lower specificity, but it's not that dramatically different. So I'm not against using just low dose dobutamine uh, because you know it may be a little more safe because some of these patients may have significant arrhythmias at higher doses, you know, of, of dobutamine. If this is the modality that you're going to use, right? Uh, you could use quantitation. So strain imaging can be used in these dysfunctional hearts, and these are you know data from uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Marwick and Associates a few years ago looking at strain and change in strain. The bottom line, if you have augmentation of wall motion with dobutamine or improvement in strain rate or strain, this is an indicator of viability in such patients. So that's during stress. Can you do something from the rest image? And I think you can. If you take a look at thickness of the myocardium, okay, if the, if the myocardium is very echogenic, and thin, meaning less than five millimeters or so, it has a high predictive value for it not being, you know, uh, viable. Although there are some data to the contrary, but the incidence of this happening is very low. So you can almost take it to the bank that indeed, if it is thin and scarred, that you may not have viability. This is from an early study by Dr. Schweig, and she's in Brazil now she may be actually listening to us, is comparison of uh, wall thickness on the left side in the same patients with rest redistribution thallium. And you could see the same similar curves of if I have akinesis or severe hypokinesis, the same trends that, you know, you have less and less uptake with nuclear. And if you take a look at, you know, what we do with rest redistribution nuclear is if you have greater than 60% uptake that it may tell you about viability, and it corresponds to about a five to six millimeters of thickness in those patients, and this is from the rest image. Now, yes, you could use it because it's in your rest image, so you can use them together. If you have a wall thickness that is decent and dobutamine stress echo, you could improve your sensitivity and specificity. You're not adding anything else. You're just taking a look at the study and take a look at what happens to thickness. So contractile reserve can be coupled with thickness for better evaluation of myocardial viability. Two other thoughts regarding this. One that we're not using as much, but I think it's important since we're comprehensive in our evaluation is looking at perfusion with contrast. We did a lot of studies in the early, early days with Dr. Shimoni when she was here. She's now in Israel. And uh, take a look at perfusion. And in perfusion, you infuse myocardial contrast and you image intermittently to look to construct curves of how much contrast there is in certain areas of the heart. This slope tells you about myocardial blood flow and the product of this tangent with the slope tells you on how much blood there is in the capillaries. Basically, the myocardial viability with recovery of function is similar to those normally functioning, meaning from flow, but certainly much less having blood, blood area in those, uh, in those segments compared to those who don't recover at all. So yes, you could use it, Qualitatively, if you just use, is there contrast in there qualitatively is very similar to rest redistribution nuclear, meaning highly sensitive, less specific. You have to quantitate contrast for you to become a little more accurate, I would say, with a balance between sensitivity and specificity. The last one, although it is dependent on, on load, is if you look at diastolic function, it may tell you something about viability and diastolic function with mitral inflow. These hearts are not normal. So you would expect these hearts to have this kind of pattern, slow relaxation pattern. If they are preloaded, quite a bit of preload there with high E compared to A, it may significantly tell you something about myocardial viability, and we did, that was part of the big study that we did, not we did it specifically for that, is Part of the studies of myocardial viability is we took biopsies at, at uh, bypass surgery. And if you take a look at the relation of diastolic function to viability, deceleration time is important. The longer it is, uh, 
right? The closer you are to what you expect in this you know, heart that's not functioning well. So it relates to the change in ejection fraction and to the number of viable segments. Importantly, if you have this slow relaxation adaptable situation to a depressed ventricular function, there is less interstitial fibrosis at pathology, there is better contractile reserve, there is a more change after surgery, they have less ICU stay, they have better New York Heart Association down the line, less admissions for heart failure, and less death or transplantation. So in summary, from an echo point of view, you have few resting situations that you could use without using contrast, if you will. You could use thickness of the myocardium, you could use diastolic function to try to help you, although it's low dependent. On the stress side, because many of these patients undergo dobutamine stress testing to evaluate for ischemia, not necessarily for viability, if you take a look at their response, contractile reserve, biphasic response tells you a lot. Whenever you induce ischemia, you know that if you abolish ischemia, ventricular function will improve. So in summary, contractile reserve is a good marker. Ischemia induction is important. Myocardial thickness you could use. Contrast echo, you need quantitation, and nowadays we're not using it because we have other alternatives to this, particularly in nuclear and CMR. So I'm going to stop here and ask Dr. Muaz al to come and join me on the podium here to talk about uh, nuclear technology and PET. Thank you very much. All right. <coughs> Guess we lost it again. All right. So that was a good introduction by Dr. Zaubi. So I'm going to continue with the nuclear techniques that we use in, to assess viability. And these can be uh, utilized in SPECT and PET. So we're going to cover SPECT, although we're not doing it here since probably for the past three years since we have PET and CMR more developed, but I think if we're gonna go to practice outside, you're gonna see way more spec being done compared to PET, and also on the board exam, both cardiology and nuclear cardiology, so these are still uh, being asked, so you need to know these a little more. So, but before that, I just wanna give you like more about our philosophy, like which patient should go for viability testing? I'm not gonna talk about the clinical trials and others, but if you're gonna decide on a approach to the patient, which patient you want to get viability imaging and which patient you're just gonna go for revascularization. Now, obviously, if the patient is younger, they probably should go get the benefit of the doubt and get viability and get uh, revascularization compared to older people with multiple comorbidities. We also can see that if the patient has ischemia, Dr. Zabit just mentioned that, that is your best marker of viability. Now, if the patient has just no evidence of ischemia and no angina, then th that might be an area where I would like to see more viability. If the ejection fraction overall is normal, then the benefit of viability testing has not been well tested. Most of these studies were done among patients with cardiomyopathies and lower ejection fraction. Obviously, if you have left main coronary disease and good targets, just go for it. Don't waste time on viability. But if you have diffuse disease and multiple regional wall motion abnormalities or chronic total occlusions like we get mostly from Dr. Shah and colleagues, this is an area where if I'm gonna spend three hours trying to open a chronic total occlusion, I wanna make sure that the risk that the patient is having is worth the benefit and I'm opening a viable territory rather than just going ahead and establish flow to a non-viable zone. And finally, obviously, if the patient is viable, overall less comorbidities, these are the patients that you probably give them the benefit of the doubt. But if the patient is sicker, chronic renal insufficiency, and you're doubting the benefit of the procedure itself, this is where it, uh, viability could make a lot of difference. 
And Dr. Zobi also mentioned that there are multiple modalities that are being used, that can be used. This is a, like the most famous meta-analysis that has been done on this topic. It's now 15 years old, so there are way more data that has been published since then. But to summarize it, as Dr. Zabi mentioned, dubitamine echo remains the most specific, but in terms of sensitivity, nuclear techniques, specifically PET has been shown in this meta-analysis to be the most sensitive for the determination of improvement in function after revascularization. So let's dig deep. How do we do it with uh, nuclear? So we measure two, we look at two ways. The first one is to look at the cell membrane integrity. So if the cell membrane is like, uh, the, there is a uh, good integrity of the membrane, then most likely the cells are viable. And this is, we measure by perfusion agents, by thallium, technetium, and also by rubidium or ammonia. Now, we also look at the cell metabolism, which is probably more of a latent uh, effect to be lost, and this is where we look for FDG, and there is some research with acetate for that. So for the procedure, how do we do it? So since many of you fellows have not seen this, this is a very simple procedure. All you need to do, if you don't want to stress the patient, like a patient is really sick, you just inject thallium, and image them, and image them after four hours, because thallium redistributes. So it's going to go out from one cell, go to the next cell. So even if there is a very tight occlusion, it's going to diffuse slowly through the, from one cell through the extracellular space, from one cell to another, and then it's just going to get there. Now, if you want to establish stress test, then you can do it. You can do stress test with thallium or technetium, and then do another injection for rest, and then recount it. So go ahead and image at three hours, uh, sorry, at four hours, or you can do an optional step where if you really want to look for the full benefit of the doubt, you can re-image them at 24 hours. Now, these procedures have not been popular because thallium has been associated with a lot of radiation exposure, so because the half-life is 73 hours, and in fact, the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology about 10 years ago or so have discouraged routine use of thallium for um, regular perfusion testing, hence the utilization of thallium has almost plummeted, and now there is not even thallium available if you want to order it, except in like in rare cases. Now, this is how the images look, so if you start with, if you start with the, um, uh, one hour, you see a perfusion defect uh, at stress, and then you do redistribution, and you see now it's filling up, so it's, there is good viability. In this case, there is full 24 hour, and now, now that doesn't mean that there is no subendocardial scar, because we look at it as a continuum. So you can see here that there is good amount of viability that would potentially benefit from revascularization. Now, if you're going to use technetium because it's more widely available, better energy if you're using SPECT, now there is a one difference, which is, again, highly tested on all kinds of boards. If you're going to use technetium because technetium does not redistribute like thallium, you need to give nitroglycerin. If you do not give nitroglycerin, then your ability to look for, for viability is going to be diminished. And there have been some studies looking at comparing that. And again, some very similar concept. You can do either rest or rest stress. So you start with the nitro. If you're just going to do rest, just give the patient nitro, and then you give the technetium and image them. Now, there is obviously no delayed imaging because technetium does not redistribute. Now, if you're going to do stress rest, you can either start with the low dose at rest and then do stress or vice versa, whatever you prefer. But again, you have to give the nitro before the rest injection. Otherwise, you will not have good data. And this is one study that looked at that, the nitrate enhanced, and it showed that actually in this study, 40% of segments were shifted with the use of nitro from being called non-viable to viable. So this is a critical step if you're using nitro. So again, I cannot overemphasize that. Now, finally, is that why this kind of 
starting waning, waning interest in um, respect for viability because despite there are some inherent limitations for that, it's mainly the radioisotope, the amount of energy. And I want to show it like the best in an example. This is a patient of mine that I took care of a few years ago. He had thallium viability, and clearly the whole anterior inferior is almost absent. The only wall that kind of took up some technetium thallium was actually the lateral wall. And this patient kept on having heart failure, shortness of breath. Uh, later on, we had PET, and this is with just rubidium. You can see how different the images are, and you can see the extent of viability that this patient has been having. And that's why you can see there are some technique lim rate limitations that have been limiting us. Now, you could say this is unequal one. One case, maybe it's not that bad. Well, this was studied in one study where they compared technetium to FTG, and what they found about 23 to 25% of segments were labeled as non-viable on SPECT, but they turned out to be viable when you use this. So if you're gonna use SPECT like later on in your career, use the, mod, the latest technology with the highest ability, you can do attenuation correction, do prone imaging, because you don't wanna have a lot of proning. Now, taken, well, that these patients are sicker and may not be able to do everything you want with them. So that's why our interest in PET and why, how does it work in PET. Now, all of you, the heart, all of you, before you came here, you probably were hungry and your insulin level was very low. So your heart was using free fatty acid, right? So there was glucagon, and this pumping, and there were free fatty acid in your blood, and the heart loves free fatty acid. You came here, there is lunch in the back, you took it, you ate, your insulin level shut up. What's your heart using now? Glucose. But it's unlabeled glucose. So we do the same experiment in the PET lab. So the patient will come to us, we do rest perfusion, and then we just go ahead and want the heart to use glucose because we're going to give them fluorodeoxyglucose. We take glucose and attach to it an F18 agent. So we take it from the, from the cyclotron, take it to our area. The half-life is two hours. But we want to ensure that the heart is going to take that glucose. We want to ensure that the myocytes are taking that. So what does it take? That we have to make sure that there is insulin on board. Instead of giving them any food that we cannot control, it has to be a very controlled experiment so we know how much glucose we give them and how much insulin we give them. So we are, by when we give the FDG, we're kind of, the labeled glucose outnumber the unlabeled glucose. So I cannot do it on you now because you, I don't know how much you ate, you ate the full pack or not, how much glucose you have. So it's going to be a trial and error. But if I know exactly how much glucose I gave you, then I know how much insulin you do. And this is the protocol that we use. So fluorodeoxyglucose is glucose labeled with F18. It goes inside the cell and gets stuck inside. So if the cell is alive, the mitochondria is alive, then it's just going to go inside and sit there. So this is kind of like the different mechanism that we use. This is just going to go inside and get trapped inside the cell until it decays and goes, get degraded. So this is like the protocol that our nurses and OPC use. When the patient comes in, they, after we do the perfusion imaging, they manage their sugar. They see how much they, they have a clear protocol, how much is their blood sugar, then they give them amount of glucose. And then they check their blood level of serum glucose every 15, 20 minutes and give them insulin accordingly. So there is a clear table. And if it's too high, then we give like as high. So this is important because I want at least 10, 15, 20 units of insulin. Each patient is different. So you can guess correctly. An obese patient, insulin resistant, they need a lot of more glucose. Patient who's thin, frail, then they need less glucose, and then we can do that. Once we get them to a serum glucose of 140, then we go ahead and inject the FTG, wait an hour for the uptake, and then image them. And for diabetic patients, somebody would say, well, this may not be feasible for them. 
Yes, that might be a little bit more challenging, but we have good success. So, so far we've done maybe four or five hundred cases here, and we have only two failures. But these were like really brittle diabetes. So if the patient is taking oral hypoglycemics, that's easy. We just go ahead and do the same experiment. If the patient is in insulin, what we want is that we want to make sure that the amount we give them in the nuclear lab is almost equal to their daily dose. So when they come to us fasting, they only get half of their dose, and then we keep giving them insulin until we kind of surpass what they take at home. My record is 72 units of insulin. We have our records here is like 40 or 50. So yeah, I always say like the most common cause of failure is the inability to give enough gluco enough insulin. Now there is a, a better way to do it, like the insulin clamp, but that's more nursing demanding and it is required. So you have two clamp two IVs, one glucose, one insulin, and you just like keep checking it. So you have to have one to one nursing, and it's better to be done like more in a hospital setting rather than like more of an outpatient center testing. Recently, we adopted a new way we where we are giving glucose IV because many of these heart failure patients may have intestinal edema, so you don't know how much they're going to have in terms of uptake of glucose. So that's why we switched to IV, and we are able to achieve that in these like much rapid, much faster to get them to inject the FDG. So instead of like three hours in the lab, now they, we can do it like maybe in one and a half hour. There are still some difficult cases, but usually it's better done this way. So how do the images look like? This is what we have. Now we have perfusion, and we have the metabolism. Here, the anterior wall is missing. It's missing on metabolism. That's what we call a match defect, which is a scar. Here, you have a match, you have a defect in perfusion, but you can see there is hibernation because there is good FTG uptake. So that area was viable despite this perfusion defect. And then there is the area where it's the other way, which we call reverse mismatch, and there's a lot of theories about it, including stunning. Here's one example also. You can see here there is a defect, and there is match defect. And this is another case from our lab here where you see large perfusion defect and good uptake except in the apex. Now, very important is that, as Dr. Zobi mentioned, that a lot of these patients will have, if they have viability and they have good revascularization, they have improvement in their symptoms. This has been shown initially in small single center studies looking at the impact of mismatch on and revascularization on their ejection fraction. There have been also some data looking at their impact on six minute walk tests and metabolic activity. And there is also data to tell you where is the sweet spot of revascularization. And this is work done by Dr. Beanlands from Ottawa, where he spent decades really studying this. And what we know from PET is that you need to have, for the ejection fraction to improve, you need to have two things on NFTG viability. First of all, a smaller scar. So if the scar is between 0 to 16% of the LV, this is where your best chance now, the scar is almost like half the ventricle. Even if you have good viability, the chance of recovery of LV function is low. So you need to have small scar burden, but at the same time, you need to have a lot of jeopardized myocardium. So both of them, you need to have small scar burden. At the same time, you need to have small area. You have, the more you have jeopardized myocardium, then the better the chance of recovery. And obviously there is an interaction between the two, but the sweet spot has been around seven to 8%. You need to have at least 8% of the LV jeopardized as well as small scar burden. How does it correlate with MRI? You're gonna hear about that, but there is good data to show that there is good correlation. And in terms of infarct transmurality and infarct size, it has been validated that there is good correlation between the two modalities. And now even there are new PETAMAR tools that where people are using them, combining them to try to study the different phenotypes where sometimes you have an area without FTG uptake, but there is no LGE.
Uh, what does that mean? And this is an area of hot research nowadays. Now, the only clinical trial I'm going to show you is a part two trial because it was a pure PET trial where in Canada they brought 430 patients with low ejection fraction and they randomized them either to standard of care or PET, PET, PET based care. So, what they did is that we're going to do the PET. I will tell you, this patient will benefit from revascularization and this patient will not benefit from revascularization. Now, the study was like very close to being positive, but technically it's a negative trial because the P was like 0.15. But there was the, the biggest trying to understand what happened there is that the issue of adherence to the PET recommendation. So what happened is that there are about 13% of or so of patients who were recommended revascularization mm -hmm. who were not revascularized and vice versa, patients who were not revascularized, not recommended revascularization ended up being revascularized. So when you do an, a non-intention to treat or on treatment analysis, there was a benefit. Now this brings us back to the real life, like how well is your trial representative? So if we look at this trial, like why there was these patients were not revascularized. The most common reason is that they could not do it. It's diffuse disease, anatomy not amenable, or the patient has multiple lesions, but he has grafts, and the grafts are patent, but more native disease, and they just could not do it. So it brings us back to the point that viability is just one measure in the management of these patients with low ejection fraction. In other words, the decision to revascularize or not revascularize is you based on multiple things that include patient risk for surgery, include the suitability for target vessels, baseline EF, degree of uh, LV remodeling, mitral rigors, and others. So the clinical decision viability is just one of them rather than everything. And I hope I showed you what nuclear can offer here and we're gonna pass it on to Dr. Shah to tell you about MRI and what does it add in these patients. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the role of MRI for viability assessment. So first thing, I think obviously this is the, you know, kind of the buzz uh, that's going around recently, which is with regard to the uh, revived uh, trial, which was uh, just published a few months ago. The purpose for this talk here is not to delve into the specific details of the question that these trials were addressing, both if you look at the STITCH or you look at the recent REVIVE trial, which was really a question of does uh, basically a management approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's many nuances to that that Dr. Almala touched on. What, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, just how MRI does viability assessment uh, to begin with. Because I think ultimately for us to have a, uh, tech, uh, to have a technique, you need a technique that accurately characterizes viability, so w with low likelihood of having uh, incorrect uh, assessment. And the second thing that is you need a therapy which then is actionable that can improve outcomes. And ultimately, that's how you'll have a trial which will show improvement uh, in outcomes based on some um, imaging-guided management strategy. So with that background, let's, let's just touch more on the issue of how does MRI assess viability to begin with. And I think one of the things you'll see is that this is really uh, over the last 20 to 25 years or so uh, from when the MRI viability assessment technique was kind of first uh, developed to where we are today. And I think over this time period, we've seen now uh, extensive histopathologic validation in animal studies as well as clinical validation in human studies. And I think that um, 
if we go back to really the kind of the, one of the early animal studies, um, and you look at these two sets of images that I'm showing you here, the one image is a histopathology. This is in an uh, animal model where the LED was ligated, and you can see the, the, uh, the heart that was sectioned afterward, and you can see the histopathology with TTC staining, but you also notice the corresponding MRI to the right-hand side of it, uh, and you'll notice that the areas of hyperenhancement track very closely with areas of TTC staining uh, on pathology. And in fact, if we take a look at one of these views and, and look at it in more detail, you'll see that it's almost an exact match. Even these tiny little finger-like projections that you have in the infarct, you're able to mimic those with the MRI. So I think you've got now a non-invasive way to get almost a, a histologic view of the heart to directly identify areas of myocardial damage as well as areas of normal myocardium. And in fact, this is a, uh, uh, in, a in a small animal model, uh, a study where they uh, did ultra high resolution MRI imaging um, and then compare that to the histology. And what they find is essentially almost down to the cellular level uh, in the setting of a chronic MI, what you see as hyperenhancement corresponds to areas of uh, fibrosis um, on histopathology. So these are human examples here, and this is really from one of the, the first uh, landmark studies in New England Journal in 2000, where you look at a series of different patients who had known infarcts, uh, you know, anywhere from uh, three to, to eight, nine months prior to the imaging. So we're now looking at chronic infarcts, and you can see the patient on the left-hand side has an area of hyperenhancement in the anterior wall, which corresponded to this LED uh, infarct that this patient had about nine months prior. On the right-hand side, you can see this person has uh, a small area of subendocardial enhancement in the inferior wall, but you'll notice the extent of enhancement in this LED uh, infarct patient is different than the extent of involvement in this RCA infarct patient. And so because of the high resolution of MRI and the ability to directly uh, image uh, viable and non-viable, we're actually able to say this is a, an infarct that's less than 25% of the wall thickness versus this patient on the left-hand side here who has an infarct that's almost transmural, more than 75% of the wall thickness. And then this patient in the middle here who had a circ infarct in the past, we can see has about an infarct that extends across 50% of the transmural extent. Uh, in this study here, uh, you can see even small infarcts with CK rises uh, that were on the order of 10 or 15, uh, you're able to see areas of hyperenhancement that correspond uh, to the specific infarct-related artery. And when we talk about resolution, this is what the spatial resolution of the MRI is. It's about 1.5 by 1.5 millimeters. Uh, and then the contrast noise, which means the, the signal intensity of your hyperenhanced area uh, in the setting of a chronic infarct is almost five-fold that of a uh, remote uh, normal myocardial region. And then lastly, no need for ionizing radiation. So how, how is this technique actually performed? So it requires a peripheral IV. Um, the patient typically would go into the scanner and we'll get a set of CINE images, which are shown here, which allow us to look at contractile function, global ejection fraction, regional wall motion abnormalities, wall thickness, uh, as well as other parameters as well. Uh, we then inject gadolinium contrast wait about five or 10 minutes, and then the gadolinium kinetics are such that it concentrates in areas where there's an absence of viable myocardium, so in areas where there's myocardial infarction. Uh, and then we perform our delayed enhancement imaging at five or 10 minutes after gadolinium administration. Um, and so now we have essentially matched views that show us uh, the structure and function of the heart, as well as an analogous view that also shows you uh, the presence or absence of myocardial infarction. And this is something that can be done uh, within the course of about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so here's kind of the, the original validation study published in New England Journal in 2000, where a series of patients that were already scheduled for revascularization were asked to, to undergo an MRI scan to uh, have CINE MRI to look at wall motion and the delayed enhancement MRI to look at uh, the extent of myocardial infarction uh, in each region. They then went on to get revascularized. About a third of the patients had PCI and about two-thirds had cabbage, and then were brought back after revascularization at approximately three months to undergo a second CINE MRI to try to see if 
the findings on the initial uh, delayed enhancement MRI could identify likelihood of improvement in contractile function. So here's an example patient here, and you can see in this patient we have really moderate uh, LV dysfunction. The EF is about 30 to 35 percent with some regional variation. When you look at the delayed enhancement MRI, you'll notice uh, in the anterior wall, it looks like it's almost a transmural infarct. It incorporates almost the full thickness of the wall. In the inferior wall, you see a small subendocardial infarct, and in the basal septum and in the lateral wall, you see no infarct at all. And in this person, uh, they went on to get revascularized with surgery, were brought back for follow-up imaging about three months later, and you can see the ejection fraction here has improved now from 30% to 45%. And you can see, for example, this area in the anterior wall that had a transmural infarct uh, uh, really shows no improvement in contractile function, uh, whereas if you look at the lateral wall, for example, um, which is at the 3 o'clock position, you can see that area, and especially if you look at the fourth chamber view, you, you see very nicely that there's a significant improvement in this area which showed no evidence of hyperenhancement at baseline. So here's what the results look like in this study, uh, in this series, which is that on a segmental basis, the likelihood of recovery of function after revascularization was inversely related to the amount of enhancement within that segment. So that those segments that had more than 75% enhancement, essentially the likelihood of recovery of function was close to zero. Um, and on the flip side, those segments that had no enhancement at all, about 80% of those segments showed recovery of contractile function. Now, in addition to looking at all segments uh, in this study, there was also an analysis done looking at those that were akinetic or dyskinetic, so the most dysfunctional segments. Uh, and in fact, what you see is that uh, instead of the technique uh, not performing as well, in fact, it performed even better, so that on the right-hand side, for akinetic or dyskinetic segments, if there was significant amount of enhancement, likelihood of recovery of function was essentially zero. Uh, and if there was no enhancement, but a segment was akinetic or dyskinetic, uh, there was over 90% likelihood of recovery of function. And then on a global basis, here's a relationship that you see between the extent of the LV that's dysfunctional but viable by your delayed enhancement MRI and the change in ejection fraction approximately three months after revascularization. And if you want to try to come up with a dichotomous threshold, if we use a 5% improvement in ejection fraction to say, hey, that's a clinically meaningful improvement in ejection fraction, how much of the LV needs to be dysfunctional but viable to, to give you uh, approximately a 5% improvement in contractile function? Uh, and in this uh, cohort here, it was about 25% of the ventricle. Um, now, the, the data I showed you was in the setting of chronic coronary artery disease. The same actual relationship, this inverse relationship between the extent of hyperenhancement and the likelihood of, of improvement in function also holds true if we're dealing with acute coronary disease where we're looking at myocardial salvage. And in fact, it also uh, holds true if we're looking at medical therapy. Uh, this is uh, patients with chronic LV dysfunction who underwent uh, beta blocker therapy, and there again you see an improvement. And so what is the underlying mechanism by which this hyperenhancement occurs despite different underlying pathophysiologies? And I think it has to do with this, the kinetics of gadolinium, which is that gadolinium is an extracellular contrast agent. It doesn't go into the, the, the uh, uh, myocyte. It doesn't penetrate through intact cell membranes or is actively excluded from them. So as a result, in normal myocardium, where there's nice, tightly packed uh, myocytes, uh, there's very little volume of distribution for gadolinium, and therefore uh, minimal uh, gadolinium uptake. Uh, in acute infarct, where now the, the myocyte uh, uh, membrane is ruptured, and gadolinium can now distribute both intracellularly as well as extracellularly, you have a higher amount of gadolinium. And in the setting of chronic scar, uh, where you have uh, a loose collagen scar matrix, uh, you also have an increased volume of distribution of gadolinium. And therefore, really, in any scenario where there is the absence of intact viable myocytes or reduction in that, you begin to see areas of hyperenhancement. And I'll, I'll just kind of highlight a couple of example scenarios real quickly. Here's a patient with extensive wall thinning. We can see on the CINE image on the left-hand side, the wall here is about four millimeters thick. The delayed enhancement MRI, 
which we see on the right-hand side, shows really a transmural enhancement in that region. Uh, compare that to a different patient. Here we see not, o not only is there a large area of wall thinning, uh, but there's significant LV dysfunction with an EF of about 30%. Um, but if we look at the delayed enhancement MRI in this patient, the amount of enhancement is actually very small. There's just a small subendocardial layer of hyperenhancement. Despite the fact that the wall is thin, really the amount of scar or the amount of myocardial damage is very limited. Um, and, and this person uh, went on to get revascularization uh, surgically, and you can see at about three months later, not only do you see an improvement in contractile function in this patient with the ejection fraction going from 30% to 50%, the anterior wall contractility started to recover, but I think most strikingly is the fact that the wall thickness has actually reversed itself, or the wall thinning has reversed itself, going from four millimeters now to about nine millimeters. And uh, this is just showing the relationship uh, that those segment or those patients who had less than 50% scarring within the thinned areas uh, showed improvement in contractile function, whereas those with more than 50% scar did not. And then I think as, as we also sh saw in the example image, reversal of wall thinning also occurred in those patients who had a thinned area but still had limited scar uh, and then went on to get revascularization. So I think you know, what this data suggests is that CMR may be uniquely able to identify uh, potentially reversible myocardial thinning. And then uh, in this series here, what was the prevalence of this in a cohort of patients with ischemic heart disease? Uh, this occurred in about 18% of patients where there was limited scar despite having an area of wall thinning. Uh, now, this is a, a study that's about 10 years old now, which is an observational study which looked at uh, the presence or absence of viability based on our delayed enhancement MRI and clinical outcomes in these patients. So obviously, this was not a randomized trial. This was just a, a, an observational study, which similar to other observational studies that we've seen with nuclear and, and echocardiographic uh, viability techniques, uh, seem to show that those patients uh, that got the best uh, improvement in survival were those that had uh, viability uh, based on MRI and that went on to get complete revascularization. Now, let's talk about a few other pieces of information. You know, so you're, you're taking care of this patient, you're thinking about viability assessment, but oftentimes there's other pieces of information that the MRI can also give you. And here's an example. This is a patient who came in with an acute STEMI, had primary PCI of the circumflex, and what you'll notice is this area of uh, low signal actually within the infarct itself. And then this area of low signal gradually fills in over time. Uh, and this is indicative of microvascular obstruction. And the importance of this is that there's, you know, this study as well as multiple others that show that it's not just the infarct size that, that uh, portends long-term outcome, but in fact, those patients who have a large infarct size and have evidence of microvascular obstruction on the MRI are the ones that have the worst long-term outcomes. Um, other uh, kind of unique piece of information I think we can see with MRI is this patient on the left-hand side here, where not only do you see a area of an RCA infarct in the inferior wall that looks transmural, but in fact, you're actually able to identify that there's right ventricular uh, wall in, uh, infarction as well, or this patient on the right-hand side where you can see evidence of uh, papillary muscle uh, infarction. Now, uh, you know, as I wrap this up, a couple of things I think that are important to keep in mind. Um, you know, we, we like to use recovery of function as a kind of a surrogate standard uh, when we're trying to determine, okay, how good is a viability testing technique? Uh, a few things, though, to keep in mind that, the, you know, that in and of itself may not be the optimal standard of truth, and the reasons for that are myriad. Uh, one is, Clinically speaking, patients oftentimes do not undergo complete revascularization. Uh, there can be variable duration of time between when the revascularization was done and when follow-up imaging was done, and I'll show you some data that suggests that, that the time duration may have an effect on the likelihood of recovery of function. Um, the uh, other thing to keep in mind, I think, is that myocardial dysfunction that you see at baseline may not be due to coronary hyperperfusion, and this gets to the concepts that I think have been brought up already, which is that what we may need to think about is not just coronary disease and viability assessment, uh, 
uh, but also look for the evidence of demonstrable ischemia. Now, obviously, if you have a patient who has angina, I think that in and of itself suggests that there's a very good likelihood that there's ischemia present, but I think uh, for patients, uh, even in the absence of anginal symptoms, that's where uh, I think a complete uh, viability assessment may really involve assessment of viability as well as an assessment of ischemia. So let me just kind of finish up with a couple of concepts. Um, you know, one is, you know, in clinical medicine, we like to have things dichotomous. We like to think of yes, no. But the reality is the physiology doesn't work that way. And so, you know, if I were to show two example cases here, these are just schematics showing a graph of the increasing amount of viability on the x-axis and the likelihood of recovery of function, although we want to see something like this where there's an abrupt threshold where I can say yes, no, this is going to get better, this is not, the reality is the physiology is probably much more linear so that, uh, or continuous, so that as there's increasing amounts of viability, there may be uh, increasing likelihood of recovery of function. And then I think, as, as I talked about already, which is, again, to try to identify not only is an area viable, but also is that area ischemic, uh, is that area hypoperfused. Uh, I think, obviously, if you've got a 99% coronary lesion, there's a pretty high likelihood that area is hypoperfused if it's still viable. But the question is, when you've got you know, lesser grades of severity of stenosis, that's where adding perfusion imaging uh, or some form of ischemia testing could be an important adjunct. And then the last piece I want to touch on is this right here, which is that the Recovery of function, although in most studies we tend to use three to five months after uh, revascularization, because again, the longer time period you wait, the more chances there is that you may lose a patient to come back for follow-up imaging. There's a chance the patient could have progression of their disease, and therefore that lesion that you revascularize may no longer be fully revascularized. But this st study right here, I think, shows nicely the, the importance of timing, and this was looking at a series of patients who all had chronic total occlusion. And what they found in the study was that for those segments that had less than 25% uh, infarction within a, a region, uh, they showed improvement in contractility at five months after uh, revascularization of the chronic total occlusion, uh, and then further improvement out to three years. And then uh, on the flip side, for those patients with intermediate amounts of uh, viability, those who had 25 to 75% enhancement, there was really no improvement in contractile function at five months, but then when they re-imaged these patients at three years, that's when they noticed an improvement in contractile function. So again, uh, the more dysfunctional, the more hypoperfused an area may be, there may be structural changes and there may be metabolic changes that then, even if you restore blood circulation, may take a longer amount of time to manifest uh, a recovery of function. Uh, even in the presence of viability. And then in this study right here with chronic total occlusions, obviously revascularization of uh, CTOs that had more than 75% enhancement or transmurally infarcted didn't really show any improvement in contractile function. So let me, um, I'm going to skip past this here, these two slides. And then I'll just wrap up with this one last uh, movie right here. This is actually um, how quickly you can do it. If you wanted to just do a quick assessment of viability, uh, you can essentially, after giving gadolinium contrast, just run this single shot stack of images uh, to, to look for uh, uh, delayed enhancement. Um, and this can be done really in, in the course of about one to two minutes without doing cine imaging or anything else, just simply looking at the myocardial structure itself. So, and then let's wrap up here. Um, so, a couple of things, uh, you know, there's no dietary requirements if you want to do MRI, so the patients don't need to be NPO unless obviously you want to do a viability as well as a stress assessment. You do need to use gadolinium-based contrast agents, um, and so in the past there was a little bit more concern uh, about using <clears throat> gadolinium agents in patients with renal failure, although the more recent guidance now suggests that the, the group two agents that we use currently are uh, adequate risk profile to use even in patients with uh, renal insufficiency. It is important to keep in mind that you can scan patients with pacemakers uh, and defibrillators, um, but that you require probably specialized sequences that may not be available at, at every uh, CMR lab uh, to get around some of the artifacts that you can get. Uh, sometimes with subcutaneous ICDs, if, especially if they're positioned uh, very anteriorly, they may cause a localized artifact, which may limit uh, assessment. Uh, 
And then clearly, if you have a patient who's on, uh, uh, who has an LVAD or a balloon pump, these are patients that cannot undergo an MRI scan because you can't put them in the MRI suite. So uh, to wrap up, I think, you know, the, the assessment of viability, I think, is, is, uh, is a complex uh, uh, process. Uh, I think it really involves uh, assessing both viable as well as non-viable myocardium. Um, one of the unique advantages with MRI is that the pure viability assessment can be done without stress. For, for management decisions, you may want to incorporate uh, ischemia testing or assessment of the coronary artery uh, stenosis severity. Uh, and then I think, you know, the data, as we've seen today, uh, I think not just MRI, but nuclear-based techniques and uh, echo-based techniques, uh, all are able to demonstrate at least that uh, assessment of viability by non-invasive imaging uh, seems to be associated with improvement in contractile function. Now, the next step of, to that, though, is to say, can that actually be associated with identifying the patients who are most likely to get a benefit from revascularization requires ultimately that you have a good therapy that's available to the patient. Um, and then always don't, you know, don't forget that medical therapy in and of itself now has evolved over the last 25 years, and medical therapy has gotten much better as well. And so ultimately for us to make a decision on when to revascularize somebody or not, I think is, is, a, is a much more complex discussion that, than we can have today, but it's a constantly moving target because again, the alternative of medical therapy, I think, is continuing to improve as well. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And then I'll ask uh, Dr. Zogby and Dr. Almala to come on up as well. Uh, and maybe we'll have time for a couple of questions. Questions? So will the uh, late gadolinium CMR uh, detect the viable and the uh, scar has false positive or false negative? So, oh, so the question is false positive or false negative. So that's a good question. I mean, as with any technique, you, you have to be aware of limitations that can occur. And so if you talk about the present, you know, false positives, what you're talking about is uh, you know, be very unlikely to see a, an entire area uh, showing a false hyperenhancement. You know, that's very rare. I've never seen that. Um, but you can have, you know, these artifacts which can give you an area of, a small area of hyperenhancement that may not be real, right? And that's why I think no matter how good your technique is, you, you still have to recognize that in individual patients, you want to carefully look at the raw images, not just the process images, and try to make sure you're not identifying any areas of, of artifact that's leading to enhancement. Uh, on the flip side, can you have false negatives? In other words, an area, a patient who has a, a big infarct, but yet you have a false negative. I mean, that, uh, you know, I, I can't think of any reasonable artifacts uh, or reasonable errors that could occur that could give you a false negative like that. Just a thought, I don't know if this is part of the protocol or not, but when we do viability with MR, uh, do we use also dobutamine to see if the segments are actually contracting, and is that, is that similar to what happened in echo dobutamine, or it's, it's different? Yeah, so there is there's some early data many years ago um, where they uh, did dobutamine MRI-based uh, techniques to look at contractile reserve and a biphasic response, just like you do with uh, dobutamine echo. The reality is to give dobutamine to a patient at multiple grades, you know, multiple stages, can take a lot of time. Uh, and if you talk about from a tolerability standpoint in a magnetic environment, um, so nowadays I can't think of any labs that are doing that currently because the, you've got this delayed enhancement MRI, which is a very direct uh, assessment technique. Now there is some data about 20 years ago where they said, let's look at those patients who have delayed enhancement MRI done uh, and have intermediate amounts so 1 to 50% enhancement, can adding dobutamine to that to see if there's contractile reserve increase the positive predictive value, the likelihood of recovery of function? And so, yeah, there, are, there is data that shows that. But even the labs, I think, that did those uh, research to date, I don't think clinically use it. Because, again, the, the direct assessment you get with viability assessment by MRI is probably the, the key piece of data. Thank you, sir. I mean, it is interesting because not each 50% uh, scar 
extent of, of uh, damage, not two patients are equal, right? Some of them may have less um, stunning or their, their myocardial blood flow may be a little different than others. Some of them may have a little more contractile reserve. But irrespective, though, the data shows that if you have 50% or less, or even 75% and less, you should be more aggressive in these patients, whichever way. Because you don't, you don't want to miss those. Uh, more than 75%, I think you would, you would agree that most likely it is. And use your clinical judgment in so many ways, right? But at least this is a data that can show you the extent of scarring. I have a question for both of you, and I think we're, we're privileged to be in a place where we could do any of these modalities, right? And the question is, for our PET and our MRI, when do you, do you go always, since this is your specialty, do you go always for a CMR, do you go always for PET? Uh, wh when would you use? And I think it's important for people who have both modalities. Yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you if you ask the fellows, they would tell you, depending upon who's rounding on the service, <laughs> would determine. So uh, I think the answer. No, I'm asking about yes, you. Yes. No, no. So I think the, the answer to the question, I think, is, is one, you know, it's based on what your local expertise is. So if you're at a place that has very good PET but doesn't have very good MRI, then I would say you should go for, with a PET scan and vice versa, right? So Because each place doesn't necessarily have access to... The, the, the strongest uh, labs in each individual modality. Now, if you have a place that has access to, uh, you know, strong uh, PET-based imaging techniques as well as strong MRI-based imaging techniques, how would I decide which patient to go with which? I, I mean, I think certainly if it's a patient who can't go to the MRI, so if it's a patient with a balloon pump, with an LVAD, anyone like that, I would say definitely that's a patient pacemaker. they can't go to MRI. Now, if it's a pacemaker, the amount of artifact you ICD get from pacemakers is very small. ICD and, because most and, of them will Right, have. and so, so what I'm going to get to next is the ICDs, and especially the bi-V ICDs, those are the ones where oftentimes you have more of an artifact. Um, you know, the artifact tends to be along the apex, so it depends also on what region you have an interest in trying to assess. But I think if I've got somebody who's got, a, you know, a small person so that the ICD generator is close to their heart, especially if it's a bi-V ICD, that's someone I might think about uh, sending for a PET as opposed to an MRI scan. Um, was? Was. Yeah, I mean, I think many patients could go either way, but at least from my, like, perspective, the ones that I would say PET may not be your best choice. Again, is the diabetics, like if they are on high amount of insulin, this is where the chance of failure becomes, and it is also cumbersome in the lab. So unless they cannot undergo MRI, we've done them, but this is where it becomes a little bit more challenging. I think I would prefer PET in the very acute phase, somebody who had an MI in the early phase, because even on MRI, you may end up with some edema, so the edema may kind of complicate. We had few cases where the edema might complicate your assessment of LGE because LGE on MRI is both edema and scarring. But in PET, the amount of uptake, if I see it, then it is a little bit more convincing uh, from that aspect. But devices, many times those who went to MRI couldn't see because there is a large wrapper. I mean, the artifact, they come to... Uh, I would say, but, but the diabetics are kind of the unique group where, like for others who are listening on YouTube or listening to the lecture later, if you are starting a PET program, I wouldn't start with viability for diabetics unless you become more accustomed for non-diabetics than get on the adventure with the diabetics because it's a little bit more challenging and requires an additional level of expertise rather than starting, especially insulin-dependent diabetics. Moaz, how about uh, metabolic syndrome, significant obesity, suspected insulin resistance? That would work if you push a lot of insulin. So that requires the expertise. You need to push a lot of insulin. And I'm telling you, we have only two cases of failure out of 500 or so. And the failures are because they didn't get that much insulin. And how do you know it's a failure? because then it's all in the blood pool. 
the myocardium did not take the FTG. It's all sitting in the LV. Got it. All right. So, yeah. How do they stitch for all the I think this is an important question. I'm not sure it's resolved because most of these are analysis of, of the cohort that underwent viability. And if you take a look at them, there are very select patients in a way. Uh, some with MRI, the vast majority actually are not with echo or nuclear. And um, we don't, besides the PAR2 study, we don't have one that was specifically designed for viability assessment and ultimately outcome of what these patients are. And you could see a lot of crossovers. And actually, there will be a lot of crossover in any study like this because of the modalities that are available for you. Revascularization nowadays is much less of an issue. I think viability, <clears throat> the changing face of viability right now, I mean, the cat lab, it comes very often. It's more about the mode of revascularization rather than whether you want to revascularize or not. Most often, the cases that come to us, we did the cath, the EF is low, there is a like CTO LAD. If the LAD is not viable, I'm just going to go percutaneously fix the RCA and CERC. If the LAD is viable, I'm just going to send him for bypass. That's kind of the most common scenario that comes to us. I think this is where viability is not done to determine whether they're going to benefit from revascularization or not, but more to lower the risk of the revascularization procedure in patients with multi multimorbidity and others. So this is kind of like most of the viability cases that come to us are kind of this is the main question. Yes, it directs therapy in a way. And that, that's why it's hard to... To look at, at the outcome with so many old options that you may have. <clears throat> and I think, I mean, the, the one thing to, to, to don't make sure we don't forget is medical therapy, right? I mean, in the end, medical therapy has gotten much better over the last 25 years. Um, and I think, you know, there, studies after studies show that medical therapy is good. So don't forget medical therapy. You're talking to our interventional yes. colleagues here, so. <laughs> yes. Hopefully, both tympanic membranes are open. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much and Happy New Year to all.